My name is Lisa Beth Lentini Walker, and I am one of the co-founders of MentorCore, um, along with Dan. You want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Dan Ayala. I'm, uh, I guess, the other founder of MentorCore. <laughs> It's funny how that works. So today um, we are thrilled to have Jay Rosen here and he's going to talk about his accidental tourism into the compliance space where he's decided to make a home. Um, so Jay, thank you for joining us today. And I know that there are people who probably don't know you. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Sure. Thanks, Lisa Beth and Daniel for having me. Uh, my name is Jay Rosen, and I work for a company called Affiliated Monitors Incorporated. They are based in Boston. I am in sunny Southern California. And what we do is we help our clients who need to bring on monitors, whether it's uh, in response to a regulator that they've done something wrong and they need to clean up their act, or it's also situations where companies proactively bring us in. And what's interesting about my compliance journey is that this, like some of our brothers and sisters who do compliance, this is not what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to go to business school and run a chain of retail discount shoe outlets in the Northeast. And- uh, That's very happened, specific. Very specific. <laughs> that was your life plan and they had you ready for who your, part, your partner was gonna be and everything else. It, yeah. was, it was done. They, they, What'd you they, do wrong, Jay? <laughs> <laughs> I, I looked up, but when we as a family would go to Disney World, uh, my father and I, since we're in the shoe business, we always looked down and are like, do you see they're wearing a pair of Nike Cortez or they're wearing Timberland? And I guess what happened was I got distracted and I looked up and then I got involved in movies and entertainment and that kept me from uh, going uh, into the shoe business. Interesting. Wow. Well, selfishly, I'm glad because you're here today. I'm glad you did. So how far back should we go in the Wayback Machine? <laughs> we can go as far as you want. We've got an hour. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll, I'll try to, uh, Lisa Beth, you know some of this already. So if you can try to keep me in the guardrails, I'd appreciate it. Very well. But um so growing up, I grew up in a place called Manchester, New Hampshire, which is north of Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, we were, I grew up in this, this city, Manchester, which you probably see comes on the air every four years or so, because up until this year, uh, New Hampshire had the first in the nation primary. And we were very lucky that we would have all the presidential candidates actually come into our homes and meet with us and, you know, learn about that. So one thing that happened at a very young age is that everyone was very politically aware. We were in New Hampshire, so it was very Republican and very conservative upbringing that we fought against. But uh, nonetheless, we got to see all sorts of legitimate contenders for the presidency and other folks who are on the fringe like your Lyndon LaRouche types. <laughs> so uh, I did that when I was in high school. Uh, I got involved with the school newspaper, which was called The Little Green. And I don't know if you can see this, but this is my press pass. And it oh says, The Little Green, uh, put it back up, go, come to me again, okay. For The Little Green newspaper, any consideration shown would be appreciated by this newspaper, signed by Alma Langlois. 1981 to 1982. That's a so, very polite press card. Yeah. So what I did is I sometimes have an angle to what I do. And I realized that if I could become the record reviewer or if I could become the movie reviewer, I would get to see movies for free and I would get to write album reviews for free. So that started in high school. And then um, for my undergrad, I went to the University of Pennsylvania, the Wharton School of Business, and I got involved with UTV, which was University Television. And uh, back in those days, it was the mid 80s. So we don't have all the channels that we have now. And I don't think anybody ever really watched the station, but it gave us a chance to play around with videotapes and to 
you know, work with other folks and pad your resume. So one of the things I got involved with was something called Movie Lineup, and it was our version of Sneak Previews, uh, the Siskel and Ebert show. So what we did was I had to go out to all the local publicity reps for the Hollywood studios, and I had to ask them to give us uh, clips that we could put on our show and to give us posters that we could promote the movies and tickets to go um, you know, to the uh, different previews that they would be holding. And, um, you know, I would call these guys up and say, you know, I, I'm Jay Rosen calling from UTV, you know, and really wield that as a cudgel. And I would talk to them and I was persistent. And after the third or fourth conversation, they would say to me, look, you know, nobody watches this rinky dink television network. And, you know, the only reason you want the posters is to put them up in your dorm room. And the only reason you want tickets is to bring girls to the movie. And I said, be it as it may, I am a member of the press and you need to take care of me. So needless to say, I was covering all the different uh, film companies in Philadelphia. And one of my crowning achievements was someone at KYW, which was the local Westinghouse affiliated uh, affiliate needed to use a clip and they wanted to go on the air that night. And I said, well, Gail, I said, it's now three o'clock. I said, I'm going on the air at 6 p.m. tonight. I said, if you can get some, a messenger here, pick up the tape, bring it back, dupe it and get it back to me, you can do it. Now, I was not going on the air at 6 p.m. tonight. I was some 19 year old college student who was relishing that he could make an adult jump through a, a hoop and if asked how high I would tell them. So that was, you know, one of my first kind of brushes with, you know, being in the media and, and having control over people or, or trying, you know, to influence people in a timely way. So because of that, uh, I got distracted from the shoe business and I decided that I wanted to come out to Los Angeles and get involved in the movie business. So that was one of the first uh, wrong turns off my course, off the map I was supposed to be taking. And then when I got here, I did the traditional thing that I worked in a Hollywood mail room. So what you have the opportunity to do is you have to do all the Xeroxing for the firm. So every time you make a copy of the script, you're expected to take a copy and read it yourself so you can start to educate yourself into what are the tastes, what what films, what properties, what stories get made into movies. And likewise, the same thing with any type of contract. And then you had to go out and drop scripts, scripts off at Louis Anderson's house. And he answers the door in a, in, a, in a bathrobe that doesn't quite cinch across the waist. So you just look up and say, here's your script, Mr. Anderson. Back to looking down. Yeah. <laughs> so after getting post in the stomach. <laughs> Real quick question, just out of curiosity, mm -hmm. is that that's actually part of the mailroom job? Uh, is to is to take copies, or is that an illegal uh, an illegal copyright? Uh, no, it's not a copyright thing, but it's. It, I mean, it, it's, it's understood that if you look at some of the folks who you know came their way up and you know out of the William Morris mailroom and big people like Barry Diller and David Geffen and those folks, as they say, information is power. So the only way you're going to learn as a newbie. The, you know, the, the big important agents aren't going to say, hey, read the terms of this contract, but they're going to expect that if you have the interest and you want to represent actors and be dealing with talent, these are the things you need to look at. These are important parts of a contract. So just like what we do from an ethics and a compliance perspective, we know certain things are supposed to go into a program. We know that because we've been working in the industry for all these years, but how would we expect somebody new or somebody who's coming into our world, we would say, look, go to publicly traded companies, go on online and pull down their policies and procedures and see what right. they do. And, you know, you're, Dan, you're working in education, right? So okay. you would say, look at some other universities and see what are the things that they're concerned about and their policies and procedures. So gotcha. I, I That's don't how the think, knowledge is passed. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't think it was there it wasn't like you were taking information and sharing it with competitors. You were using right. information internally. So um, after doing that for a while, uh, I got out of the agency business and I started working at 20th Century Fox. 
And uh, we were a department known as physical production. And what we basically were, were the budget police. So every day I would get a call from a film that was shooting on the lot. And they would say, our first shot was 6.23 AM. We broke for lunch at 12.23. We shot three and three pages. And our last shot was 6 PM. Now, the reason we would want to know this is that you have to give your hours, your actors a 12 hour turnaround. So if you start shooting at six in the morning on Monday, you might shoot next at seven on Tuesday. And by the time you've gotten all the way to Friday, you're not having your first shot to noon. So that information needs to be calculated because you have to give the actors and the crew their turnaround. The other thing that's crucial is we wanted to see how many pages they were actually shooting, because if you, if you kind of pencil it out and look that every day they're losing an eighth or a half of a page, after five or 10 days, they're starting to be in a serious deficit. And you need to realize, okay, well, do we need to bring in the producers and the directors and take a look at where they're going? And so here comes another very interesting lesson that I learned that I think will have some application and interest to people in the ethics and compliance field is I would go to my boss with my little Excel spreadsheet that I made and say, look, it looks like speed is going to be 10 pages over budget after, you know, four weeks. What are we going to do here? So you've got the people who are the bean counters like us, and then you've got the creative execs who are the ones that take the, used to take the four martini lunches at the Palm and Morton's. And Basically, what happens is it's good cop and it's bad cop. And the reason why we're following all this information is to kind of let the creative people know that, hey, you don't have a, a, a free run here. It's not the uh, inmates running the asylum, but we're keeping tabs on you and we want to let you know that we're watching. And then the creative guy, the head of the studio says, well, you know what, Jan, I think you're doing some real good work here. So we're gonna, we're gonna work with you and allow you to move forward. So I'm 23 year old Jay Rosen and I'm mad as hell because my boss didn't stand up and take away days from, uh, you know, from the movie. And they said, look, it's a game. We're playing a game here. They need to know we're watching and now we have a currency to hold that over their heads. So again, sometime, I learned here that, again, there's this information is power, right? That you need to be watching. And we in ethics and compliance are sometimes doing the teaching, but quite often we're doing the watching too. And we're also, besides doing the watching, we should be doing the listening. And we should be hoping that the folks that we're working with feel comfortable enough to speak up. So if I you know, didn't do my job, at the time, the physical production department wouldn't know where the movie's standing. And then concurrently at that point, the studio wouldn't have had any information or leverage on how to move forward together with the talent. So it sounds to me like this was kind of your first control guardian type role where you had to involve yourself in some type of um, reporting and enforcement. And it also sounds like this was one of those situations where um, it was really challenging um, for you to be able to, to say what you see and then have actions taken in alignment with what your views were. Or not taken, as it were. Yeah, or not taken. So, um, but I think part of that is, is the enthusiasm of youth, right? That you want to get in and you wanted to make a difference. And not only did I, I like the fact that I was doing something that I thought was important to me, but uh, I was only seeing one part of the puzzle. So I think just like we have folks who are, you know, picking up the torch for ethics and compliance, and sometimes they're known as an ethics ambassador, they may or may not understand the importance of their role number one, and they may not know what is something that you need to address. And some things, they're just things that are there for to talk about the guardrails or just talk about what's customarily done. So I don't think I did anything wrong. And then in, respect, in retrospect, I think once I learned why I was doing what I did, I didn't feel like I was wasting my time. I felt like I was part of the process. And 
you know, n nobody gets a blank check. You just can't, you know, you just can't run rough shot and do what you want to do. So I think that was, you know, part of what I was learning. And then another thing that I really learned about the entertainment business is it is like any business is very uh, relationship driven. And part of what, you know, I wanted to do is like when I was going on to set, uh, I wanted to be able to be um, looked at, not the enemy. So mm -hmm. it's somebody that if they had a problem, they could approach me or if there was an issue, but you really want to keep those lines of communication open. And again, that's something that we're all talking about now that, uh, you know, especially in a me too and a speak up uh, society and, you know, to, to read the newspaper today about the Washington football club yeah. and just to see how it just gets worse and worse. And, you know, even with people speaking up, there was a department of one or it was a roadblock. So how horrible to have to go to work in a place and, and to be treated that way. So, you know, even though with people speaking up, they still weren't able to make changes. And now we're 20 years into this ownership group and it just sounds like they're an absolute train wreck. So after the entertainment business, some of my colleagues said to me, hey, Jay, you went to like a legitimate school and you've been playing around in the entertainment business for the last 13 years. So what are you going to do with your life? So I thought that was a good question. And some colleagues of mine from uh, Wharton were putting together a middle market investment bank called Focal Point Partners. And I was able to join Focal Point as a vice president of business development. So I thought, well, that was pretty good. You know, I've been in the entertainment business for 13 years and I'm able to, you know, transfer over into a complete different uh, t type of uh, employment situation and I'm able to come in as a vice president. So once again, I was in a situation where I didn't know much about investment banking, but I knew about treating clients and customers well and I knew about uh, you know, how to take meetings and how to get information. And, uh, you know, one of the things I would guarantee everyone, whenever we had conversations, I would say, you know, if you don't want to work with this bank or you're not excited about buying the software that I'm selling you, at least you're going to get 30 to 45 minutes of good Hollywood stories. So that's was, that was always my fallback. And, and I think I've done that from each part of my career. So if, if you're keeping score at home, We've gone from the mailroom at a talent agency to physical production at a studio to working on a picture called The Perfect Storm with uh, George Clooney and Mark Wahlberg and working on that movie from 1998 to 2000. And what was interesting was uh, Oh no just when he was going to get to the interesting part <laughs> or the most interesting part. <laughs> well, let's see how, let's see if Jay, uh, if Jay's internet resumes. There he is. There we go. Oh, Jay, we lost you that. the most interesting part was, and then you froze. It, it was a, it was either a phenomenal moment. tactic to build up. Yeah. This is what you learned in Hollywood to build tension oh, yeah. and excitement. <laughs> <laughs> um, so did I, did you hear anything about the casting of the perfect storm or was that completely? No, no, no. Just okay. that you were working on it from 98 to 2000. Okay. So uh, initially the lead of the movie was supposed to be Nicolas Cage and then he fell out and then it was supposed to be Mel Gibson and then he went to do the Patriot. And then finally we got George Clooney as our lead and he had just worked recently with Mark Wahlberg on three Kings. And I remember being across the hall, listening to, to the director, talking to George and George thought he was going for the Mark Wahlberg role. And the director said, no, George, you're my captain. You're going to sail the Andrea Gale and you're going to be the hero. So if you think about those three different actors, it would be a much different movie than we got with Mel Gibson. I rather with uh, if Mel Gibson was in it or Nick Cage was in it versus George Clooney. So based on that, I was saying, so we went from the entertainment business to the ethic, to the um, investment banking business. 
And again, I had to kind of use my wits and learn how this business worked and what needed to be done. And I think what got me into this little tangent was that at least when uh, I was speaking about the entertainment business, they might have some relatively uh, interesting stories like the one I started to tell before the camera got off. So uh, 2008, my wife and I have twin daughters born 41 days early, no, 10 weeks early, 41 days in the NICU. So that's February of 2008. Market crashes in the fall of 2009, and they decide that they no longer need a vice president of business development because all the transactions are now bankruptcies and they just show up at your door. You don't need to look for them. So now I've got to um, pivot again. And this is where I first started my connection with LinkedIn that I put on a message to my network saying, you know, I'm looking for a new opportunity, uh, you know, reach out to me. And there was a company called TransPerfect, which is the world's largest privately held translation company. And they were trying to be my uh, provider for a virtual data room, which is a secure online space where you can go to do a transaction or to, to look at information. So they had an idea that they thought this would be a great way for studios to share screenplay assets. What typically happens, like when we were talking, Dan, about your concern with the, mm -hmm. with the screenplays and whether or not they go, you know, they get leaked. Um, this would be a way where you could digitally share the screenplay, it would have a digital watermark on it, and it would be unable to be printed. So the only way you could really get a copy of it would be if you physically took a picture of each page with a digital camera. And if you have 120 pages of your life to waste doing that, you know, mazel tov, have at it. But um, so here's now where the careers start to interlock, that my relationships with the different studios, having worked there on the talent side and then having worked on the movies, I was able to reach out to the folks who might need this service. So we ended up getting ourselves involved with an RFP at Warner Brothers and they, it looked like we're, they were gonna move forward with this. And at the end of the day, they realized that there was not enough loss or shrinkage happening, that there really weren't people stealing the screenplays, so they didn't wanna move forward with it. About six weeks later, uh, the story comes from Harry Potter in England, and they're working on the first Potter movie, and somebody gets schnockered and leaves their copy of the script underneath the table at the pub. Mm -hmm. So now they're saying, oh, well, maybe we should have done that. Um, you know, to go full story ahead, they ended up adopting that system. So we were just a little bit on the fringe of technology that back then in 2000, 2001, people were not running around with their iPads. People were not running around with their iPhones. So if you're a big time Hollywood mogul, you're not going to expect to carry a heavy six pound computer to the beach in Malibu and to read scripts on that. You're still gonna want it done the old fashioned way. You're gonna want your people to print them out and bring them to you. So um, what happened was my colleagues at um, TransPerfect liked my professionalism and how I was moving forward on this project and it was on a, you know, an if come basis. So I wasn't getting paid by them at all. We were working on this and they decided to offer me a job working as their West Coast representative for their VDR, which was called Deal Interactive. So I did that. And then I thought, well, they have translations that they're selling here at this company. So, you know, maybe I should learn something about translations too, because I want to be able to have more things to sell. So I get involved with something at a law firm called Pearl which is an acronym for the Pillsbury E-Discovery Alliance of Resource Leaders. And this is with the law firm Pillsbury Winthrop and some other vendors within the legal and compliance space. And we were at a closing meeting and they said, deal, uh, this Pearl solution should be used on every FCPA matter. And like a, a good lemming in the room who didn't know what the acronym meant, I kind of shook my head, yes. And I went back home and Googled it. FCPA, and it says Fairfax County Park Administration. And I say, <laughs> this is not what we're talking about. So then I get to the next thing and I see 
Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And I see, ooh, these are companies that are doing business globally and they have issues. And oh my God, they're in China. And oh my God, they're in Brazil. They might need translations. So this is where we start to officially pivot towards ethics and compliance because I realize that the virtual data rooms are not the things I want to be helping companies with, but the things I want to help companies with is legal translations that are certified documents that you need because you might be uh, having a patent infringement suit or there might be uh, you know, crime or you know, something that's happened overseas that needs to be investigated. So I leave uh, uh, the translation company and I join another company called the Merrill Corporation, which used to be um, headquartered in um, St. Paul. And um, I started helping clients do the translations, but what became more interesting to me was I didn't just care whether or not they had a code of conduct and it had to be translated into 40 languages for 80 countries, but the question was posed to me, all right, if we want to say we have zero tolerance for bribery, do we want to just have a flat statement like that and have that apply to each jurisdiction? Or do we want to say in French under the law, sapin de, we don't want to have this? And do we want to quote local things? So suddenly my expertise that I was providing was not just doing a word at 18 cents a word, but I was talking about what I had seen other countries do in similar jurisdictions. So suddenly the value proposition I was offering was I could come in and say to somebody, look, you're going to give me your code of conduct and policies and procedures in English. And eight weeks later, again, with the eight weeks as the lead up, eight weeks later, what? I can't wait to find out what, what, what happened eight weeks later. Work, but I was giving them somebody who understood more than just doing uh, translations. Jay, we lost you at the word eight weeks later. Again, with the perfect timing, you left right. us on a cliff. So eight weeks, weeks later, I would delete, deliver electronic files that had all 40 of those languages. But what I was doing again was helping a client offload a significant piece of business, but I was more than a vendor because I made myself part of the team. Right. And I think that's really what started me thinking about Okay, so this, this is like got to be important if there's admonitions not to do certain things in a business sense. And I'm starting to think, well, you know, this is like a good thing. I've got little girls that I'm bringing them into the world, and I'm doing a job that really has some helpful implications. So I, I, I want to learn more about this, and I want to move forward with it. Hey Jay, we got a question in. So not to 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 slow your flow here, um, but someone's wondering: Are there a lot of companies that tend to customize their code of conduct by mentioning specific legislation for each country, or do you think that there's a mixture there? What are you seeing? Um, so I'm seeing this in kind of like you know uh, retroactively three, three years ago, because it's not what I'm focused on now at affiliated monitors, but I was seeing that there was probably about an equal split that if there was a country where you were doing business and they had anti-corruption laws. So Brazil, the UK, France, um, you know, other things you would want to appeal to people on a local basis because nobody ever wants to say, I'm doing this because the UK Bribery Act or the FCPA says it, but you want to say I'm doing this because my country has an issue with bribery and corruption and we don't subscribe to it. So I think it probably takes a little bit more effort to do it that way and localize it, but I think you have better traction with your local employees and, you know, it's the easy way out just to say, you know, we have zero tolerance and that's not bad either. Uh, as my good friend Tom Fox would say, whatever choice you decide to make, document, document, document it. So if the authorities or if you ever have to look back and see why you did something, you'll have it in writing and say, we chose to do X, even though, you know, we had an opportunity to do Y, but X was what we wanted to do. 
and even beyond FCPA, the, um, you know, the idea of making something resonate with somebody locally and giving them no opportunity to say, oh, I thought that was an EU policy. I didn't have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we're at the point now, we're working with Merrill and, uh, you know, as I just mentioned, Tom Fox, uh, who's been a real great mentor to me, he allowed me to appear, appear on his blog uh, cast or blog post. And then uh, about 219 episodes, Tom reached out to me and he said, we are going to do a podcast every week called This Week in FCPA. And I said, absolutely, let's do this. So we uh, earlier this year celebrated our four year anniversary. And, um, you know, most of the folks who do commentary in the FCPA space are either folks who are former attorneys or who are journalists. And it's not very frequent that you see somebody who's on the sales side of this uh, speaking about FCPA and ethics and compliance. So I, again, it's part of me, I think, trying to keep coming back and turning in and localizing myself and my experience. So just like I could tell that person who was trying to do their code into 80 languages or 80 countries, 40 languages, I could tell a war story that could connote that I understand what they're up against. So I'm going to be able to be their problem solver. And part of this um, became getting involved in the FCPA world and uh, really knowing who all the outside counsel, the big white collar crime attorneys who work at the AM 100, AMLA 100 and AMLA 200 companies. And at the same time, getting to know all the ethics and compliance folks. And that brings me back to LinkedIn again. So just like I used LinkedIn to try to move from the uh, ethics, rather from the investment banking world to my next step, which became uh, virtual data rooms, translation, and ultimately FCPA, it was always about connecting with those people in the community. And I think last week when Valerie was on here, you were all were talking about using LinkedIn and somebody said, well, you know, somebody might reach out to me, but if I really don't know them, you know, I may not accept them. And I pretty much, um, I usually connect with six to seven out of every 10 people I reach out to on LinkedIn. And part of that is either I'm reaching out to them, thanking them for, you know, providing uh, an article that was part of the podcast or, you know, taking a look at who we share in common. But I think as long as you have the outreach and it's genuine, most people will accept it. And I can tell you a story that our, our mutual friend, Mary Shirley, when she was living in Hong Kong, I had reached out to her and said, you know, we have X, Y, Z uh, in common. And, you know, would you like to link in? We not only linked in, but we met in person on Hollywood Boulevard when she took a trip coming through LA from New Zealand. And ultimately we did business uh, and I was able to do translations with her, but that was after, you know, getting to know her for three to four years. So, you know, I've got, I don't know if it's just the, the prism in which I view the world, but I, I see those folks who may be, uh, you know, good people to connect with. And, um, you know, sometimes it's because we both went to the University of Pennsylvania or sometimes because we both worked with a certain colleague. But what my advice would be is to like, look at those things you have in common, whether you practiced at the DOJ at the same time, or whether you both worked for uh, a company that sold data room solutions, whatever it is, reach out and be thoughtful. And then you need to make that connection. Uh, you have to remember something about them or you have to do something that's memorable. So, you know, back 10, 11 years ago when my twins were born, everybody got to hear Millie and Michaela stories and how you could tell one from the other because one had a pink hat and one had a green hat. But that was, you know, what I was selling. And again, that was early in my career doing the translations, but I was selling myself and my, uh, you know, my, my personality and my, my caring about people. And I think ultimately, you know, when you want, if you have an issue, Lisa Beth, and you want to call somebody up, who, who, who are those, that inner circle, or who are the people that you have 
you know, developed relationships in the ethics and compliance field? And who are those folks that you go to? Oh, it's absolutely my wisdom council. And there's, you know, a small group um, of people who I know are good at heart is number one, who actually genuinely care um, and who want to um, lift others as they rise. You know, it's, it's the people that you really have that connection with because you find them to be authentic caring human beings beyond just a transactional like what's the job we're getting done and mm -hmm. that's you know that's you and that's mary and that's uh, uh, you know uh, uh, dan and it's a whole bunch of of people um well maybe not a whole bunch of people we'll, we'll call it a handful um but <laughs> but right you you do want to have those you know connections that take time to foster and it, it really is investing in other people and seeing their potential too um, their potential for greatness and how you can uh, help them in their journey. And, and going, you have been going out of your way to do so. And, and Jay, you have been one of those people that just consistently is solid and cares deeply about people and it comes through in every interaction. Um, and, you know, I remember not too long ago, um, we were doing the first Keep Calm and Compliance on, and one of my shout outs was to you because, you know, when I started out my business, you were one of the people that I connected with and said, hey, I would love to get your thoughts on, you know, what is it like to start a business and what should I know and what should I think about in terms of places where maybe I wasn't showing up. So thank mm -hmm. you again for that. Yeah, and, and, and that's part of it. Um, you know, I think people in, in, in being authentic, you need to give without re expecting to receive. And so that was, you know, meeting somebody who was in Hong Kong, right? And starting up a relationship online, a, a business relationship and saying, you know, how can I be of help or how can I assist you? So I think we are we are very lucky in our space that there are many uh, dear friends that we have that have been in the ethics of compliance space and, you know, worked in big corporations like you did before. And then I, I think it's just got to be so exciting to being able to pivot and build something which is your own vision. And, uh, you know, when I look at my career and what I've done in the past two or three decades, none of it makes sense. No, no, you know, it's, it's kind of like you could say, okay, and then he did this and then he did that. And you know, the only thing that makes sense is the computer cuts me off when I'm going to reveal a juicy tidbit right now. But to having gone from um, the entertainment business, so in, in that mailroom, dropping off scripts to Louis Anderson. So doing that, working on movies, working on deals, working on FCPA. And now, because we're getting close to, uh, to, almost no we're not quite there but we'll, we'll get this done before the top of the hour so uh i'm at the translation company that's based in minnesota unfortunately private equity comes in and buys the company and daniel and lisa beth you know what the next part of the story is the new owners decide well we've got an office in london and we've got an office in galway it's a lot cheaper to have the office in galway so let's not worry about our folks in london who are using us and you know what, we used to have a weekend shift that would run Friday night through Sunday morning. And if somebody needs a translation, they will just leave it on the voicemail. We'll pick it up Monday and we'll start work. And I'm like, au contraire, mon frere. You know, some of the biggest deals that I ever got was because I was ready at 8 p.m. West Coast time to take a call and to know that I had people backing me up in Europe who could immediately start working on this. So I quickly came to a conclusion that I could pencil this thing out and say, I'm going to get to a point where I won't be able to recommend myself to my clients because I'm not going to be able to service them the way they need to be serviced. So this was um, in the summer when it happened and I realized that I wanted to line up three job opportunities that would be ready for me to go into the next year once the, once the um, bonuses were paid. Why, so two, why three? Why? Because three is the magic number. Oh, is it? <laughs> is three the magic number on Wednesday? 
<laughs> one you're not trying and five's overachieving? Yeah, I, I don't know. I just thought that three was a good number. I, I think that maybe part of it was because two of them were translation companies and I was feeling itchy that I wanted to get out of translations. So, um, you know, my colleague, Eric Feldman, who's one of the principals here at Affiliated Monitors. And uh, back again to networking, there's an organization Eric and I both belong to called Provisors, which is uh, something that we've really gotten to take, adva take advantage of in the Zoom world now, because you get together with 20 or 30 other business professionals who do related things. You get to learn who they are. And then what we used to do in a regular world was actually go out and have lunch with two other people and have a troika. And now we're not able to do that. We do that Zoom. So everybody does Zoom troikas. But now our world has been expanded from Southern California and Boston to add people who are joining us from Seattle and people joining us from Chicago. So it's really grown our network. And if you know about life here in LA, I can go to one of these meetings now and not spend three hours in the car going back and forth. So Eric said, you know, I, I understand you're looking for a job and you come from a translation perspective, but have you ever thought about getting into monitoring and ethics and compliance? And I said, well, that's pretty interesting. How do you think that would work out? And he'd say, well, basically the folks that we are talking to are white collar crime attorneys and people who you know, help clients who get into problems with regulators. And we're also talking to some of those same folks that you speak to internally at the corporation. We're talking to the CECOs and the CCOs. And he said, I think that with your knowledge of the industry that this would work for you and, and that you would make a successful trans transition. Oh, and by the way, not only do we want you in a business development perspective, but we actually want you to go out and do what you're selling. We want you to monitor. So when we had a client that was a global infrastructure builder of airports and freeways and building the new bridge as a third span they're putting over the Panama Canal. When we used to travel, I was in Panama City twice within a 24 month period and once in Mexico City. And that's really where you know, the rubber meets the road because I was able to not only uh, talk about what I was going to do, but I was able to go in there and successfully lead focus groups and make sure that the changes that we were making into people's ethics and compliance programs were not only sticking, but that they were, you know, actually taking root. And some of the best things is like when you're running one of these focus groups and you can actually see the light bulb go off over their heads. And the company brought in a, a real, a, a younger group of folks who were not tainted by the bribery. And we asked them, well, how do you feel working about this company with all the challenges they had? And they said, we feel really hopeful because the company is very transparent right now. And they've said, we're not going to do business with the government of X country because there's pressure to bribe and we're only going to work with private, you know, opportunities where there won't be such a, uh, you know, there, there still could be potential corruption, but it's an, it's, it's a safer way than working with the government of X. So when you see the enthusiasm that comes up and people are telling you, you know, we did in-person training and we did all this, either they all studied the night before and somebody gave them the answers to the test, or we were having a genuine effect with them. And, you know, that, that's the bit now where I think there are a lot of people who do business development but they never really have actually done the service of the product they do. So that, you know, really excited me. And I think it really, you know, dovetails well with what I'm doing with um, a, a lot of my, my blogging and podcasting and all, all that stuff. And, you know, I really have Tom to thank for that. He's been a great mentor there. And um, as people have probably seen on LinkedIn this week, uh, we are marching up to his 500th episode. So he's done this for 10 years or so. And there are gonna be special podcasts the rest of the week and his 500th anniversary show will be on next Monday, the 31st. Wow. So, I mean, huge accomplishment for Tom. I mean, you've been with him for how many years now? Four? Um, four yeah, we're starting our, our fifth year. So we're, this week we'll tape episode 220 and we do about 50 episodes a year. Amazing. So one of the things that you mentioned really struck me is that 
early on, um, Tom was one of your key mentors. What characteristics did you see in Tom or in mentors in general that made for good mentoring? That's a good question. Um, Tom, as you, you've gotten to spend a little time with him as of late. So, you know, he's a real, I think, down to earth person. He is very um, approachable. And uh, I, I probably, you know, the first way in, uh, he's a big Houston Astro fan, and I'm a Boston Red Sox fan. So, of course, you know, if we're going to all these ethics and compliance conferences and watching sports together, that's probably one inroad in. And then we could taunt each other because both our teams are full of cheaters. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think that would be it. I, I remember being in D.C. and it was uh, during compliance week and I was supposed to uh, have a meeting with Mike Volkov, who's also one of our commentators on everything compliance. And I went up to meet uh, Volkov and it was on the second floor of the... Um, hotel that they usually have compliance week at. And um, Volkov says to me, do you know Tom Fox? And I'm like, well, I know of him, but I don't know him. And I met him there. And he was just like, if, if I didn't know he was Tom Fox, he just would have looked like, you know, a regular guy there in a blue blazer wearing his polo glasses and, you know, wearing his conference attire chinos. But um, I, I think Tom never really... Uh, you know, he just wants to educate people. I think he's really excited about the topic. And from starting off, you know, with FCPA, he's just really built such a, um, such a resource for people. And we have our colleagues, the great women in compliance, Lisa Fine and Mary Shirley, and just the great programming they're putting out. And if you go to the Compliance Podcast Network, and you've got a question about something ethics or or compliance or coronavirus, I'm sure there is a podcast that Tom has created that talks about it. And if he hasn't, bring it up with him and he'll probably do one with you as well. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Sounds like, so availability, available, accessibility and, uh, and genuineness are a uh, work. Yeah, and, and just really, you know, how we're all in this together. It's kind of like we, we've got this little team that we've kind of picked up people, you know, over con conferences and conventions and over the past couple of years. And, and now we're either, you know, even though we're kind of landlocked now, we still have this opportunity of Zoom and, and getting out and, and making, uh, you know, good friends with people and figuring out how we can be of service. Well, I think this, this time has actually been a boon. It's the golden age, the rebirth of the golden age of of connectivity, of talking to people, of communicating with people, people are redoubling down, redoubling on 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 efforts to stay in touch because they really have no other choice. And it's, uh, I think it's it's really beneficial uh, when you take and make the most of it. And I think you know one of the things that we talked about last week with Valerie was um, there is an element that is really important here because lack of connectedness is worse for you from a health outcome than smoking or high blood pressure. And one of the things that's really challenging right now is that people tend to try to get things done quickly over Zoom, which leads to really transactional interactions mm -hmm. as opposed to meaningful interactions. So trying to make sure that there's some space and, and energy left to really connect Mm -hmm. is is challenging right but it, it so you have to be really thoughtful about doing it yeah so um we're coming to the end of our time and we always ask or almost always ask um what's the best advice you ever got from a mentor okay so uh, this is the big pearl of wisdom that everyone's been waiting for so um my dad was an avid golfer and he took me to the course when I was a little boy. And unfortunately I didn't share his same passion for the game. I became a more proficient golf cart driver than golfer. And uh, for my sales career, I fear that I may have left thousands of dollars uh, out on the golf course because I was not a competitive golfer. <laughs> but I remember being five or six years old and hearing my dad say on the golf course, 
little boys should be seen and not heard. And at first I thought, well, that might be a harsh rebuke of a small child looking back from today's lens through the 1970s. But I took this as a positive and I was thankful that my dad wanted to spend time to me, with me and took me to the golf course and gave me access to the world of adults. And the price of mission was for me to keep my eyes and my ears open and be ready to contribute when somebody had a question. So the lesson in the golf course etiquette prepared me on how to socialize myself in elementary and junior high and in college and in the working world. So my dad taught me that I didn't always have to know what to say, but if I wanted to listen, I could find a way into the conversation. And, uh, you know, that and probably, you know, combined with the fact that I have sold shoes ever since I was 13 years old and the family business. I think if, if you've got kids and you want them to succeed in life, they shouldn't be afraid how to interact with adults. They should, you know, be able to learn to address adults and, and be part of that conversation. And, you know, that's going to help them succeed moving forward. And if you're in a sales position, you know, part of the reason that I really can read people well is I would see a guy come into the shoe store and you could tell this guy did not like to shop. And he was a size 13, so he didn't have a lot of opportunities. So if he asked me for a pair of black um, slip-on shoes, I'd say, well, Ms. Mr. Danvers, can I also get you a pair in brown and can I get you a pair in cordovan? And I said, how are you doing on the slippers that your wife bought you over at Christmas time? Are you through them yet? Do you need another pair? And let me give you a pair of these new running shoes by this Japanese company called Osaga. So we would get to the end of the thing and he'd walk out with nine or 10 pairs of shoes. Now I'm 12 years old. I'm not getting commissioned on this because it's my dad's shoe store. But again, I figured out Mr. Danvers hates to shop. So if I can make this painless and have him do it one time a year, and if he walks out with $300 worth of shoes in 1978, which I don't even want to guess what that's worth now, but that is again, at a very young age, learning to listen, to pick up those cues and learning how you can be helpful. That's great. great. I want to buy shoes now. <laughs> I just now, did. You always <laughs> want to buy shoes. People always want shoes. <laughs> well, I think this is terrific. I don't see any um, additional questions in the chat, um, but we did want to thank you so much for sharing your journey. You've shared so many pearls of wisdom that I we're, we're going to figure out how to get them out there um, on social media and also for our members. But thank you again for being part of Mentor Corps event series and for sharing your wisdom with everyone. Jay, it was great to meet you. Thanks for being here. And I can't say, I, can you guarantee that this that your journey wasn't just the script that you ended up giving to Louis Anderson and you're playing it out? <laughs> that would be extraordinarily meta. <laughs> Stranger things have happened. So I, I can't positively saying no it was not that script but <laughs> well I said, I'm glad, like I said like I said at the beginning I'm glad you ended up taking you ended up booking up uh, and that it brought you here to be able to share this with us thank you so yeah. much thank you so much have a great day